happy monday here we go we're starting a whole brand new week i know you've got to be excited because everybody loves mondays right okay so i'm going to continue on in james i know i kind of skipped over that um saturday um however this next part of James, we had left off at the end of chapter one. So now we're at chapter two. Now this is sort of divided into two different parts. So what we're going to focus on this morning is going to be verses one through 13. Trust me, that is enough to focus on because this is some serious, serious stuff that he's talking about here. Now I've tried to make some mo <laughs> notes. Here we go again. So you'll have to excuse me if I look away and look at my notes, but I don't want to forget anything because there's so much to be said on this topic. And I know some of you might say, oh no, here we go. This is a controversial topic. No, it is not. People have made it into a controversial topic. Why? Because they're not following biblical principle. If you follow biblical principle, pay attention to this. If you are a Christian, you live by the Bible. And if you follow biblical principle, there is no controversy whatsoever about this topic because it is crystal clear how Christians are to behave. So, I don't want to see a single solitary comment on here about discussing a controversial. Things are, you know what makes controversy? Uh, two people that are, have different opinions. Well, the Bible is the one truth. There is no other opinion, unless you're not a Christian. So, if you're coming against this teaching, then you need to rethink uh, your position on Christianity. So, <laughs> sorry, that was a little harsh, but it, it's just the plain truth. We live in a day and age where you just, it, it doesn't pay to sugarcoat things. So, uh, starting with the, chapter two. Now, keep in mind, this is uh, written by James. James is the half-brother of Jesus. And during the time that James wrote this. This was a, a time where um, basically the rich were steady taking from the poor. There was so much prejudice. There was so much partiality being shown. And that's why James wrote this. Okay. He, he starts off by saying, my dear brothers and sisters. So he is including everyone. Brothers and sisters, the people he's talking to, they are his brothers and sisters in Christ. How can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Now, favoring some people over others can very easily be defined as being prejudiced. And that's exactly what he's talking about right here. For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry. And another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, um, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well... Doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? That's exactly what it says. When you judge someone and you form an opinion of that person based on appearance, social status, the color of their skin, their background, their criminal record, their job description, their financial status, any of these things, their appearance, whether or not they have tattoos or piercings or uh, colored hair, when, whether they're tall or short or fat or skinny, when you're judging someone and treating them differently, because 
of something that you see. That is prejudice. That's what he's, James is warning us against this right here. So moving on with uh, verse five, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters, hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? So you might ask, what is he talking about God chosen? Well, you know, the Beatitudes, as they are frequently called, uh, where Jesus said, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? So what he's referring to is the fact that, you know, the rich are, they're treated with like royalty. But yet, and right during this time when he was writing this, the rich were steady taking from the poor. They were taking their land, stealing their land. So he's saying, this doesn't even make sense. You're treating them good because they're rich financially. But look at what they're doing. So where's the sense in that? Okay, sorry. I pause it because I'm flipping in scriptures and I'm trying to save time here. Um, in Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is the God of God and Lord of Lords. He is the great God, the mighty and awesome God who shows what? No partiality and cannot be bribed. So all the way back in Deuteronomy, it's talking about how God shows no partiality. I mean, aren't we glad that he doesn't show partiality? If we were all judged and our place in heaven was determined over how much money we had or what we looked like or what kind of clothes we wore or what brand of clothes we wore, is that how you want to be seen? And do you know, every single one of us is guilty of showing some form of partiality. They did a study in Paris um, that I was watching actually this morning where they have a man who is dressed basically like what you would think of someone homeless, you know, dirty clothes, uh, not very clean shaven. And he walks out onto the street, people during busy time when people are steady walking by. And the man, you know, coughs and then he falls down. Okay, now keep in mind, this study was done prior to COVID. So let's don't judge this based on the coughing part. That's not the point. But so the man coughs and then he literally falls down and lays on the sidewalk. And people coming by, they look at him. They see what's happening. And some of them... They walk on by. Some of them walk around him and walk on by. Okay? So the exact same place on the street, exact same time of day. Another man comes out, does the exact same action. Like, walks out. As a matter of fact, it is the same man. But he's wearing a suit and nice shoes. And he walks out. He does the exact same cough. He falls in the same manner, lays in the same place, crowded street. People rush to help him. What does that tell us about our society and who we are as a people? We are all guilty of judging people. You think about it. You walk in a room. <coughs> excuse me. You walk in a room. You size it up. You see the people around. You look to see who's wearing what. Who's doing what? We all do it. But it's telling us right here that that's a sin. That's showing partiality. That's treating people differently based on exterior. There is so much symbolism and so many things that can be taught. James is such a rich book. And there's not enough time in my morning devotionals to um, teach everything that needs to be taught. You are welcome to put your thoughts and comment, biblical thoughts, biblical ideas or analogies or symbolism that you see so that we can extend the learning process. 
Okay. Sorry, I'm still flipping around in the Bible. I'm going to get out of Deuteronomy now. And uh, let's see. Um, so, this was written during the 15th century when James wrote this. So, what was happening then is still happening today. You notice he wrote in present tense. Well, that's because this is universal. This is still happening today, and he knew then what he was writing was. Uh, let's continue on. Uh, verse 8. Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. All right, so the royal law during that time that was, you know, recited over and over was um, the law of love your neighbor as yourself. Love God first and love your neighbor. When Jesus was asked at the Sermon on Mount Sinai, what were the greatest of the commandments? That is what he listed. First, you should love God and secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's what they were referring to when they said the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself, but if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You're guilty of breaking the law. So it doesn't say if you love some people over others, it's just not a good thing. It literally says you're committing a sin. Some people may say, well, it's not a very big sin. But a sin is a sin. You don't uh, judge sins on a scale of tiny and large. Sin is a sin. It's all the same thing. For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. So that, that's the whole point of what it's making here in verse 10 is that breaking one law is the same as breaking all ten. It's, it's still the same guilt. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges. So... Let's just flip over here and define mercy. There were two definitions of mercy that I looked up. The first one is the proactive display of God's love to the guilty and the compassion extended to those in need. It's how God shows us mercy, a proactive, that means an ongoing display of love to the guilty, and compassion to those in need. Another definition for mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone when it is within your power to punish or harm them. So that's saying this person, you have the ability to punish them, you have the ability to harm them, but instead you show compassion and forgiveness. That is the definition of mercy. And that is what it says, um, what it's talking about in verse 13. There will be mercy for those, there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. So, <coughs> excuse me, if you think of it on a level of, you're going to get back what you put out there, if you show this compassion and care and mercy, that's how God's going to, uh, what God's going to show to you. If you don't, God's going to show you what you showed to others. God's going to treat you like you treated them. Judgment day is going to be a rude awakening for some people. It's going to be extremely difficult. So, there are four elements of partialism. Now, I want to go ahead and say I got this from a sermon that was taught by Pastor Mark uh, Yule. So, his idea of the four elements of partialism is, number one, external. 
When we see people, we automatically judge them based on their external. As we were talking about earlier, there's so many factors that play into external. Clothing, appearance, color of their skin, color of their hair, <laughs> jewelry, status. All these things are the external. When you see someone, that's initially what you think. And you immediately size them up. So the next element of that is quick assessment, which means you look at them and you immediately decide what you think about that person. Uh, the third thing is distinctive behavior. After you size them up and determine what you think about them, then the next step is you determine how you're going to treat that person based on the external, the quick assessment, and the distinctive behavior. Now, the fourth element is bad motives. So, you see someone, you size them up, and then you treat them differently, but you treat them badly because of something that you saw on their external. God looks at the internal. God looks at people's heart. And that is how people are judged. And we are to learn to look to the inside and not the outside. It's scary how um, often we all fail on this. Loving your neighbor as yourself, the royal law, that's not, um, that's not talking about the person that lives next door. When they say neighbor, this is symbolic for anyone that you run into. This is not uh, limited to the person you borrow sugar from next door. So don't think that as long as you're good to the person whose house butts up against yours, you're solid because that's not how it works. Neighbor is defined as anyone you come into contact with. Love your neighbor as yourself. The two foremost commandments, love God, love people. Hang on. Sorry, I keep pausing. I'm having, to, I'm having interruptions over here on my end. You have to understand that I film these early in the morning before we leave to go to school and work. So I've got dogs constantly trying to go in and out, kids getting ready for school, etc. I personally need to be doing something. Um, however, I'm, I'm trying to put all these points into this, and I know it's a lot to pack into a very short devotional. Like I said, there's, there's so much more to this, but I'm trying to hit the highlights here. Two components that we need to consider as far as partiality. Um, the first one, genuine faith looks and lives beyond externals. So to have genuine faith, to be following biblical instruction, you have to look beyond the external. You have to get to know someone's heart, just as God gets to know our hearts. Um, I got tickled in um, a message that I heard from Pastor Mark Yule. Uh, one thing that he said in regard to this, and this is a quote from him, he said, genuine neither looks down nor sucks up. So if you take that little phrase of his and apply it to your life, you'll quickly see where you're going wrong. If you're not looking down and you're not sucking up, <laughs> you might be in the right place. The second thing is to love others requires acknowledgement of our guilt and an appreciation for God's mercy. So we all have to, I'm sorry to stab myself with a pen. We all have to acknowledge that we're all guilty of this. We are all guilty of assessing people on the external. We are all guilty of walking in a room and sizing someone up. You know, there, <laughs> I mean, 
I'm sorry. I am who I am. And, um, yes, I have tattoos. I do have piercings. Uh, this is not the only tattoo I have. I have crazy colored hair. Now, I have my own reasons for all of these things. But when I walk into a room, I see the look on people's faces. Now, I generally get one of two reactions. Either one is, oh, my God, I just love your hair. I just love the way you look. And, oh, wow, you're so different and unique. That's one reaction. And that's great. I love that reaction. That is <laughs> great. Um, the second reaction is from those other people who go, you know, <laughs> They uh, gather up their kids and kind <clears> of <throat> scoot over and to the side. <laughs> Those people look at me like they think I'm about to rob the place. Which one is more godly? Now, I'm not saying that everyone has to like the way... I appear or dress. I'm not saying everyone has to rush out and um, run into their local uh, beauty supply and purchase some rainbow hair color. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying when you look at someone, the people who are looking at me and gathering their children, they know nothing about me. And something they don't know is that I am one of the kindest, most loving, most giving people you will ever run into. I would literally probably risk my life to save those very children that they are gathering up, but they don't know that and they won't get to know that because they're too busy judging the external. And that is what we've got to make sure that we're not guilty of. There are people out there who have prejudices of every kind. And like I said, this is not a controversial topic. This is biblical. You're either with God or you're without God. And that's our thought for today.